How we doing, everybody, and welcome in to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. It is Sunday night. We made it through the weekend. And if you're listening to this on Monday when the podcast is released, you made it to Monday. So fantastic there. Hopefully, everybody tuning in here down in the south is safe. Everything from Hurricane Helene down there. Prayers out to anybody who was affected from that situation coming off this weekend. I, I don't even know where to start, right? You came off this weekend. There was two very disheartening games between the Packers and Vikings and the Badgers and USC. So I don't want to start there. I don't want to start there. I don't want to start the show on a bad note. So I want to look right away. I want to look into this Brewer team because we haven't talked about the Brewers in a while, right? They kind of went on the wayside. You get into the fall, you get into Badger football and Packer football. It's so hard to get back into the Brewers. <clears throat> Not well. I shouldn't say it's hard to get back into them, but you kind of forget about them with Packers starting up and the Badgers rolling. But I tell you what, after that last, watching those two games this last weekend there, I want to get to the Brewers to start here. So the Brewers, they win the final series of the season over the New York Mets. That was fantastic. That was fantastic to see the Brewers pick up that series win. Fantastic in the sense of, I know... Baseball doesn't seem like momentum carries week to week, game to game. But honestly, over the years watching this Brewers team heading into the playoffs, it always made me nervous, right? Because they always went cold before the playoffs started. Well, now, coming off of two series wins against the Pirates and the Mets, you kind of like what you're seeing. You like what you're seeing out of this Brewers team heading into the playoffs. Makes you feel a little bit better, right? Makes you feel just that little bit better. Hopefully, we're talking about good things for a while now with the Brewers heading into the playoffs here. But that final series win, great stuff there. But now we await what's going to happen in this wild, wild card race because we have no idea, right? It's between the Mets, the Braves, and, <clears throat> excuse me there, the D-backs to see who is going to get that last wild card spot, who's going to be in those two wild card spots there. So in all, I mean, the one team I don't want to see out of those three would be the Diamondbacks, right? I, some about those Diamondbacks, they just, they scare me. I don't want the Brewers to see the Diamondbacks in that first series. Now I know you get into the playoffs, you got to beat who you got to beat, right? You don't get to choose at times. But if I had a choice, I'm taking the Braves or the Mets over playing the Diamondbacks in a three-game series. That's just me. That's just where I'm at. Watching the Brewers play the Diamondbacks this season versus the Mets and the Braves, I would take my chances with the Braves and the Mets before I would take my chance with Diamondbacks because something about that team, they out of those three teams, to me, they seem like the most complete team, right, in the Diamondbacks. The Mets, they're a solid team all the way around, but they don't do anything fantastic, right? They find ways to win games. They're almost eerily similar, and I, I don't think they're like the Brewers, but the way that they play, the way that they win baseball games is eerily similar to the way the Brewers do it. Looking at the Braves, starting pitching is where they're at, right? The starting pitchers, starting pitching for the Braves, great. The lineup banged up this year, so you can't really count on them scoring runs, but they, they find ways, right? They find ways, but when you look at them, it's starting pitching that's going to carry them. The Diamondbacks seem like the all-around better team out of those three teams, so if I'm the Brewers, I'm like, uh, hopefully, just hopefully, the Diamondbacks, we don't end up with Diamondbacks, and one of these two teams knocks the other one out. So looking at what's going to happen there, how that doubleheader is going to work now taking place uh, tomorrow there, is the winner of the first game of the doubleheader is automatically in between the Braves and the Mets. So if the Braves win game one, they're automatically into the playoffs. So they will get that second wild card there. If the loser of the first game wins the second, that team is in the wild card game as well. So if the Braves win the first one, they're in. If the Mets win the second one, they're in. They would face the Brewers in game one. If not, if, say, the Braves or the Mets got swept in the doubleheader, the Diamondbacks get in. So the Diamondbacks need one of those two teams gets swept out of it, right? They need one of those teams to get completely just kibosh, gone. Now, this is where it's going to make you nervous if you're a Diamondbacks fan because you're sitting there watching this uh, game here. The Braves and the Mets both know that the second game of that double, they got to win game one, right? So if the Braves are really feeling anxious, they're going to throw one of their better pitchers in that game, right? And then if they win game one, in game two, they're like, I don't want to waste anybody now because we have the wild card game starting tomorrow, right? So we don't want to waste anybody. So now we're going with some eh guy to start game two. 
that adds, you know, makes it easier for, say, the Mets to score runs there, right? You, you would think, right? Get a lesser starter in there. It's going to help them out. So the D-backs are in a tough spot right now. D-backs are definitely in a tough spot. That's okay for me, right? That's okay for me as a Brewer fan. I don't want to see the Diamondbacks. So I'd be okay. I'd be okay if this was a split in that series or in that doubleheader between the Mets and the Braves and Diamondbacks just get gone. That, that'd be okay with me. That'd be okay with me there. So the Brewers await the winner slash loser of that series there. You know, whoever whoever ends up coming out of there between that one. So the Brewers heading into this wild card series, everybody's looking at, you know, who's going to make the roster, who's not going to make the roster. We don't know yet, right? We know Sal Frelick, from what I heard, is Sal Frelick is not going to be playing in the wild card series. He's banged up. Hopefully get him back after the wild card series. But with that being known, I still think so. Starting pitching wise, this is this is what my postseason roster is going to look like. And anybody in the comment section, if you're watching in, if you have somebody else or a starting pitcher, a starting pitcher or reliever, whatever, or throw me your uh, roster you think should make the playoffs, right? Or if you have any controversy, to me, make sure you throw that in the comments too. But my starting pitchers, I'm rolling. You got to roll with Freddie. I there's no ifs ands or buts about it. Freddie's in in the rotation, no matter if he starts game one, two, or three. He's in the rotation in that three-game series. I'm putting Tobias Myers in there. I think Tobias Myers has done enough throughout the season. He earned this spot in the rotation going into the playoffs. He's got good stuff, right? I'm rolling with Tobias Myers in there. He looked good in his last outing. And then Frankie Montas, I'm putting him in there as my third starter. I, 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 You could go with Colin Ray, right? You could go with Savali. I don't trust Savali, right? And Ray looked like he got roughed up. Well, you know you're not going with Ray now because he did start in that last game against the Mets. So we know Ray is not going to be a starter in that series now. But even before that, when I made my list, even before Ray did start there, I just I did not see Ray as a guy I was rolling out there. I was having Ray into the bullpen, which is what I'm going to get to here in a second, is my bullpen arms. But between Savali, Ray, and Montes, I'm going with Montes. He's got the experience. He's got the velocity. He's got the stuff to get the strikeout stuff that you're going to want against some of these hitters. I like Montes. I'm going to roll with Montes there in game three. So I got Peralta lined up game one, Myers for game two. And then if you need a game three, Frankie Montes is your guy. I know there's a lot of people out there who would maybe save, let's just say, Peralta for a potential of needing him in the later, later in the series there. There always is that question mark, right? But you want to start the series off on a good note. You want to get win game one there. Then maybe you can tinker, right? If you feel more confident with Tobias Myers, but you still feel confident with Montes, you could roll Montes in game two. And then in game three, then you could say, oh, well, game three here, we're going to go with Tobias Myers. Now, you could roll it that way. I'm not saying it's a terrible idea when it comes down to if you don't trust if Montes was in a do or die game three, that he could get the job done. Okay, maybe you roll it that way. But you want to win the first, you win the first two, get it over with, right? So I got Peralta, Myers, and Montes rolling out for my starting pitching staff. My relievers, I I really do hope they bring up Brian Hudson. I I don't know where he is. I they haven't said anything about Brian Hudson in a while. We keep seeing these relievers get moved around. I do not want Nick Mears on the postseason roster. I am going to be like dead set on that one. I do not want Nick Mears anywhere near the bullpen for the postseason. I am bringing Brian Hudson back. I don't understand if they are shutting him down for the year or what's going on. I don't know if anybody else has heard anything about Brian Hudson. But when I'm looking at this guy right now, what he did early on for the Brewers, yes, the velocity may have started to go down. But at the end of the day, I'm bringing Brian Hudson back up. He's in my bullpen for the postseason. Jared Koenig, he's a no-doubter for me out in the bullpen there. I'm putting Jared Koenig out there. Trevor McGill is also in my bullpen. Aaron Ashby has pitched fantastic for the Brewers since coming back up and being instru- uh, put into that bullpen. So I'm putting Aaron Ashby out in my bullpen there. Devin Williams is a no-doubter. Like that's I don't even have to explain myself on Devin Williams. And then it gets to the dicey ones, right? These are the ones where I feel like people could change. Maybe they could find somebody else who they'd rather have in there. I got Yoel Piamps. I, I don't think they're going to all of a sudden say Yoel Piamps isn't good enough for this bullpen. We've been throwing him in not higher leverage situations, but near the end of games. So I'm seeing Yoel Piamps is going to make that postseason roster. And then we'll see. I really do think Colin Ray will come out of the bullpen for the Brewers. I 
people have said Joe Ross. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm not putting Joe Ross in the bullpen. I would rather see Colin Ray out there. And then you look at maybe adding another pitcher back there to add, you know, having eight arms out in that bullpen. I'd be looking possibly at Savali to be a long relief guy. You know, you don't know what's going to happen if Myers can't go long or Montes there or Freddie, right? Freddie likes to, he gets, I mean, he gets so deep into counts, right? He gets to a lot of three, two counts before he does get an out that you might need a long reliever like Savali or Ray to be able to get you further into games there if Peralta or one of them guys can't go the distance for you there, get you to like the six. So I'm having Savali in there or, I mean, I I don't know about D.L. Hall, right? I've had mixed feelings about D.L. Hall. Do you trust him? Do you don't trust him? I don't know if I trust him fully yet. I would say if I had a choice between Hobie Milner and D.L. Hall, I'm rolling with D.L. Hall simply because I think D.L. Hall's got stuff that can get you out of innings. Milner worries me, right? He needs a ground ball or a fly ball to get out of an inning. And ever since he, I mean, practically for this entire season, there has been stretches, but at the same time, I just haven't seen it with uh, with Hobie Milner that I feel comfortable. I, I just have not felt comfortable with Hobie Milner yet. So I'm keeping Hobie Milner off my postseason roster. I don't know if that's what the Brewers will do. Probably not. They love Hobie Milner. I don't. I don't have a problem with Hobie Milner. I like the guy, right? I like the guy. He just, he doesn't do it for me. He doesn't do it for me. So I'm keeping Hobie Milner off that postseason roster there. So those are, those are my pitchers. Those are my pitchers heading into the postseason. Looking at the position players, I'm looking, you know, catcher, Contreras, no doubt, right? I'm carrying Haas, right? I Haas coming off the bench as a pinch hitter is fantastic. He has been fantastic for the Brewers. I mean, essentially... All season long, all season that he has been up, he has been very good at the plate for the Brewers. So I am keeping Eric Haas on the roster. I'm carrying three catchers because I know they're not going to send down uh, Gary Sanchez or they're not going to keep him off the roster, right? Sanchez is your pop, so you're keeping Sanchez there. So I'm carrying three catchers, I guess. I'm carrying three catchers into it. First base, you're going to have Hoskins and Bowers. Both those guys will make the roster, right? You know they're going to. And then Tyler Black, I'm bringing Tyler Black with me. I'm bringing Tyler Black with me there. Second base is Terang. Shortstop is Willie. Then you have Ortiz at third and then Monasterio. He'll be on the postseason roster. I almost guarantee in it. And he's your utility man in there. So I got Monasterio on there. Outfield, pretty straightforward with Churro, with Churio and Mitchell and Perkins. I think Brewer Hicklin's going to get the fourth outf- outfield spot just because Frelick, like I said, you're hopeful that he can come back sometime in the postseason, but from what we've heard so far, he will not be available in the wild card series. So going to have to make do without him. You still have a solid outfield, right, with Churio and Mitchell and Perkins. You still have some solid guys out there. I just like me some sale, and the guy's a consistent bat, right? He puts the bat on ball, puts the ball on play. Yes, the hard hit ball isn't there. He's a soft contact kind of guy. I get that. But I there's something about a guy who consistently puts the ball in play and makes defenses have to work that changes the lineup. So ha- not having Sal out there and for his defense, right? I believe he ranked up near the top in defensive runs saved. I had the list. Yeah, he's right, 15th in all of baseball there in defensive runs saved for right fielders there. So he's the number one guy for runs saved there. And then you look at second base, Bryce Durant is number one on that list there. So you love seeing that two Brewers getting on there. But that's what I mean. I mean, you look at Sal as a whole, he might not have the flashiest average. He might not hit you the most bombs. But the guy puts the ball in play, and he plays fantastic defense on top of that. That's going to be a tough replace when it comes to postseason baseball. So you have good gloves. Yeah, I mean, you got Perkins, right? He's fantastic. I, you know, I've argued with people on this that he might be the best center fielder in baseball, right? I've, I've argued, like, defensively, I would take that guy over, I would say, most of everybody in baseball, right? I, I would do it. I would do it. This guy is fantastic. You still have Mitchell out there. He's fantastic out there. So I don't know. Probably Mitchell in right field, Perkins in center, and then you're going to see Churio in left field there, and then Brewer Hicklin will be that fourth outfielder there. So there is my postseason roster from what I see, what I where I think it's going to stand. We'll see, right? You never know. You never know with the Brewers, right? Brian Hudson, I believe he should be called back up for the postseason there, but we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him in months, so I have no idea. I I keep looking up Brian Hudson. I'm hoping somebody on Twitter 
has said something about Brian Hudson, where he is, why he isn't back up yet. If somebody has reported on it, you know, when they sent him down, Pat Murphy said it was one of the toughest things in the world because he's one of your better pitchers and you're sending him down to the minors and it just didn't make sense. And then he came out with the velocity thing and then you're trying to understand it. And I I thought I did, right? I thought it was going to be, you know, maybe a week, right? Maybe two weeks, right? And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, now Hobie Milner came back and now Nick Mears came back. And you're sitting here like, where is Brian Hudson? Why is Brian Hudson not back up? And now we're at the end of the season and we still don't see Brian Hudson. So I have, I have no idea. I, I honestly have no idea what is happening. And I, I have no idea. I, I'm going to be honest with you. I got no idea with that, with that take there. So we'll see. We'll see what happens there with the Brewers roster heading into the playoffs. Should be announced here in the coming days before we see the Brewers taking on, who knows, right? Who knows at this point, either the Braves, Mets, or Diamondbacks come Tuesday there. We're going to be live again on Tuesday, hopefully right before the Brewer game. Uh, before first pitch, so we can talk about the game a little bit, get going as the game gets going there. And, well, we got lots to talk about. So let's get on with it, right? We got lots to get into. We got the Badgers. I don't even know what to say. This was one where I was contemplating it all weekend, right? After that game, I'm sitting there and I'm contemplating and I'm like, what happened, right? We watched that first half against USC. and I honestly, at the end of the first half, I'm sitting there, sitting there on the couch, and I was like, man, right, man, they found something. They find, I don't know what it is. You know, the big play right away, Braden Locke hits uh, Vinny Anthony. And I, I was like, man, like, big play right off the bat. Big play to Vinny Anthony, 63 yards. I'm like, wow, this Badger team has found something. They finally found something. And then USC comes back out. There's a punt. There's another punt. Gets a little dicey there for a while. Then the Badgers go and they score another touchdown there on the pick. And I was like, okay, okay. The Badgers, they're up 14 to 7. And then all of a sudden, USC kicks field goal. Badgers go and score again. It's 21 to 10. You're sitting there just, I mean, you're like excited. You're like, this is Badger football. We're fine. Not, it wasn't a complete round Badger football, right? It wasn't. Like, it was the prettiest of first halves. But you were sitting there and you were like, I I had that feeling, right? Where I was like, this Badger team, I, this could be a route. USC is playing bad enough. This could be a route today. This could definitely be a route. And you look at the, you look at the stats at halftime for the Badgers. They were one for four on third down. They had 204 total yards at the end of the first half there. 130 of them through the air, 74 on the ground. They had three penalties for 25 yards. The penalties did kill the Badgers in this game. And they held on to the ball for nine minutes and 16 seconds. You look at that on the flip side, USC had the ball for 20 minutes and 44 seconds. So you're sitting there and you're like, the Badgers have put up 21 points in nine minutes of game time. That's awesome. That's awesome. You're sitting there like, wow, like they are putting it to USC today. But then I really started to think about it. And I was like, okay, USC has been on the field for 20 minutes, right? They've had the ball for 20 minutes of this game. The defense has been on the field for 20 minutes so far, almost 21 minutes so far. That got me worried leading in the second half. But I, you know, being the optimist, you guys know me, I'm that optimistic guy, right? I was I, always optimistic, never, usually never. But I was, opt- I was, my optimism was glowing. I was like, here we go. I've talked so much crap about Longo and Fickle and everybody else in between. This second half is just going to be great, right? Second half comes, and I wish they could have ended the game at halftime. I really wish. We could, this was a tale of two halves, right? This was a tale of two halves, and it went south fast. And, I mean, that's what Luke Fickle had to say, right? He comes out after the game, and he says, obviously, you can't go on the road and play two completely different halves and think you're going to come out with a victory over anybody okay fickle okay so then what went wrong what went wrong in the second half for the badgers that well here we are right here we are so my biggest thing coming out of that second half was the muff punt definitely did not help the cause right the muff punt was a killer but i know what everybody is thinking right now the one play call the one play call that everybody is thinking about right now. 
the fourth and one. You, I mean, this is where it's like you, everybody says, nut up or shut up, right? That's the biggest thing, nut up or shut up. You got the ball, fourth and one. It's nut up or shut up time. You bring the horses in, right? That's what we loved about Badger football. They call it the hippo package. You brought in all the – everybody. You had defensive tackles in there. You had some massive guys on the front line, and they were just going to bury it for a yard. That's what you loved about Wisconsin football. What do we see again on fourth and one? What do we see again? We saw it against Alabama. You thought we would have learned. No. Instead, fourth and one, we're in a shotgun. And I'm sitting there like, I, I even before the play, even before the snap, I'm sitting there like, are you serious? Are you serious right now? Fourth and one from the shotgun, we're going to. I was just about to lose my mind. I was just about to lose it. And then the play call. So from the shotgun, we're going to do a handoff straight ahead, right? We pull both tight ends, which is, in fairness, you have play calls like that. Where does the play happen, right? We're going straight up the middle. Who makes the play? Outside backer. Where are the tight ends pulled from? And you're watching this, and you're like, what are we doing? What are we doing? And then, to make matters worse, Barry Alvarez, right? Historic man, Barry Alvarez. Text, he tries to call, I think it was, was that Brad Nessler up there? I'm, I can't remember if I'm thinking right. I think it's Brad Nessler up there in the CBS booth there. And that play call was so bad. Barry Alvarez tried to call the announcers, and then he sent them a text and said that it was a terrible play call. Barry Alvarez is texting the booth and telling him it's a terrible play call. I, at the moment, I laughed, right? I laughed. But looking back on it, that tells you how bad it is. And then you see the reaction over social media. Braylon Allen comes out, on, I believe it was on Twitter. He says, I'm going to hold my tongue for now, but y'all going to see me on a podcast one day explaining exactly what was going on my last season there. Two laughing emojis. Braylon, just tell me what's going on. Tell me what happened, dude. You're, you're out of Madison now. It don't matter. You tell me what happened because I want to know. This is a story now. You got to tell me what happened there. And then you have Frank Kaminsky. I will never understand why you would go in the shotgun on fourth and one. Jake Ferguson, bring, Jake Ferguson tweets out, bring back the power. Why? Why? I, I, I don't get it. Fourth and one. And then you got, I, I, I saw another quote there from uh, Luke Fickle. I was trying to find it there again. He was talking about the fourth and one calls and why, why that's, oh, here we go. On the, they asked him on the failed fourth and one in the third quarter. He said, that's probably one of those, just like a drop punt on special teams. We work so hard on special teams. We put so much time and effort into it. We put all of our players on special teams. So it's similar, right? We pride ourselves on being able to get fourth and ones. I don't care where it's at, backed up in your own territory or not. That has to be an opportunity for us to establish who we are. The last two weeks, that's been something that's cost us. <clears throat> Luke, I, I don't know how else to explain this. And this just, I'm not the, the, this football guru, right? I'm not sitting here as an armchair coach who's telling you how to call a football game because I can't even call a Madden game right, right? I sit there, I'm Madden. I can't call that game right. But what I'm telling you right now is there is not many play callers out there who on fourth and one without, I mean, if you have a boatload of speed or a boatload of, I mean, I don't know, big blockers, I, I don't know what it is. If you, if you have a lot of speed and you're going to go to the outside, okay, maybe, just maybe you can run in the shotgun, right? I think Alabama ran one in the shotgun against Georgia on a fourth down, or Georgia ran one against Alabama, one of the two. But Wisconsin has failed twice on this same play call. It's a simple thing, right? I, I don't even – the Eagles made it known as the tush push, right? Just go straight ahead with your quarterback. I would have rather seen the Badgers try to throw the ball on fourth and one. To me, I would have rather seen them try to draw up some play action bull crap that maybe would have gotten a positive yardage. Shotgun. Pull the tight ends. Nobody left on that side to block the outside backer. They were loading up the line. <clears throat> I don't get it. I don't get it. Yes, the muff punt cost you. He said it there. The muff punt cost you. I agree the muff punt did cost you in that game. I do. But end of the day, on a fourth and one call, I don't care where it is. On a fourth and one call, run with the power, right? I don't know what this Badger team 
and that was going to be one of my points. <clears throat> Offensively, I don't know what we do. I, I have no clue, right? One play, I see Braden Locke drop a dime over the top to Vinny Anthony. And then we go back on the next drive, and I think we're a power-running football team. And then all of a sudden, we're trying to throw the ball around again. And then all of a sudden, we're turning into a play-action team on one drive. And then we're doing this. And it's like, what are we? Are we a run-first team? Are we an air raid? We're not an air raid offense. I can tell you that much. I've seen air raid offenses. This is not an air raid offense. I don't know what this is. There is no development happening on the offensive side of the football right now. There is nobody in – I. If somebody can name me somebody on the offense who is getting better week after week, I would love to hear it. I haven't seen it yet, right? We're supposed to be this – we had all these quarterbacks in the room. We had so much talent coming in at quarterback. Where's the talent, right? Where's the talent? I'm not saying I'm giving up on Braden Locke, but I don't think Braden Locke has gotten better since I saw him last. I'm watching him out there, and it looks like he's still anxious. It looks like he's still nervous, like he doesn't trust himself, like he doesn't trust this offense. Where is it? I don't know what is going on in Madison right now, but there has got to be some pants on fire right now in Madison. There has to be. There has to be some seats so hot that they don't want to sit down. Because between Longo and Trestle and Fickle right now, there is nothing going right. There is nothing going right. This program, I get it. It's year two. I get it. I get it. It's year two. But you have to see some kind of direction that it's going and right now if this is the direction that this what they're hoping for we're going backwards right we could have kept paul chris and jim leonard and we could have beat western michigan and south dakota by 40 and then we could have lost to alabama and then we could have lost to usc name me the difference there is no difference no difference. Everybody can say, oh, Paul Christ wasn't recruiting well when his uh, tenure was up and Jim Leonard's defenses weren't that good. Tell me the difference because I'm not seeing it. I'm not. I think the Badgers have talent in the room, but now I don't have a coach that can use it. Right? Phil Longo sucks. I, I am going to stick with that. I am done with his offenses. I am done with whatever he is trying to do. Right? I honestly, <clears throat> I was texting with my uncle. We always text during the Badger games or whatever game it is, Brewers, Badger, football, basketball, whatever it is. We're always texting, you know, back and forth. And before that fourth and one call, I honestly texted him and I said, this might be one of the better games or best games that Phil Longo has called and in Madison. I said, everything makes sense. There's nothing crazy going on. We're just keeping it simple. We're doing the little things. <sighs> And then came that fourth and one call. And then everything just slowly went south. And I lost it. I, I, I didn't know. I was lost with what Longo was trying to do. I was lost with the direction of this team. I am, I am at loss of words with this Badger team right now. The pass rush, I thought, got better. I thought it, the pass rush has been getting better. But when I look at the defense in this game, and you look at the time of possession between the two teams, I can tell you why USC got hot down the stretch and why the Badgers looked like they were just toasted. They were on the field for 40 minutes of game time. Now, you can blame getting three and outs. Yes, yes, they, they had to find a way to get off the field on third down. I agree. They had to find a way to get off the field on third down. But how many three and outs did USC force that the Badgers couldn't even move the football? They couldn't even move the football. And now we're seeing punt it right back to them. Punt it right back to them. And now the defense is back out there. They were torched. Right, The defense was torched come the second half. Come that fourth quarter, the defense was just done. They were out of gas. Right, The secondary was lagging. I don't know why I would have had Holman on that, I believe it was Lane. I believe it was that, uh, it was the name Jeremiah Lane, or I can't remember his name there. I know his last name was Lane there. Uh, let's see here. For USC, Jacoby Lane. Jacoby Lane, sorry there. Jacoby Lane. I would add, if you're going to go man-to-man, -man, I they were trying to man-to-man -man him with just about everybody on the football field outside of Hallman. I mean, he ended up, four Queen was on him a couple times. They were targeting him like it was their job, right? It, it was every play they were going after him, it seemed like. And then we've seen a, a couple times where you had, I mean, everybody out Xavier Lucas ended up on lane at moments there. And I'm looking at it, and I'm like, 
I'm having Hallman just ball. He, he's all over him. I'm having Hallman on lane every – if you're going to go man, I'm having Hallman on lane every time. I don't care if he's got to chase him across the field. He is on him every time because Hallman is your best pass defense. He's your best corner in that room, and I am putting him out there. Is Xavier Lucas is going to be a fantastic corner. I believe he's going to be a good corner. I do. But Xavier Lucas, he's young yet. So I'm putting Hallman out there. And if you've got to put it, you know, then if you want to zone everybody else, zone everybody else up. I don't care. But the way that Trestle called that game on that second for that secondary against a very explosive, very good wide receiving core for the USC Trojans, I, I was lost there too. I mean, just the way that these coordinators are scheming up games and calling games just baffles me. Just baffles. So if, if Luke Fickle's not on a hot seat, then somebody has to be on a hot seat, right? Because I'm watching this Badgers team, and it doesn't look good. It doesn't look good. You're not putting Luke Fickle. You're not just all of a sudden saying, Luke, you're done. Get out of here, right? So you're looking at the rest of them, then. You're looking at Phil Longo. You're looking at Trestle, and you're saying, your defense needs to get better. Your offense needs to get better. Your play calling skills, your scheming needs to get better. So you look at both them guys, and you say, hey, I know we're only four games in, but it don't look good. Nothing looks good. You guys need to figure it out, or we're going to find elsewhere. We're going to go elsewhere with your position, because right now it is not good. Right now it is definitely not good. So I am looking at this team right now. I mean, at least the punter had a good game, right? The punter had a good game. I believe uh, Bertram's had six punts for 299 yards. Four of them landed inside the 20, and his long was 74 yards. Your punter had a good game. You don't want to say that, but your punter had a good game. So that's great. That's great. I mean, fantastic. Fantastic there. I, Man, I, Badger fans, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss with this team. I'm at a loss with this team. I don't know what my expectations were heading into this season. I, I really don't. Um, I, I did not see this. You know, those week one and two games, kind of set the tone for me because the Badgers won those games, but it's the way that they won them. It wasn't impressive, right? And then you get Alabama and you get blown out on your home turf. Now, Alabama's a different kind of cat, right? I mean, that game against Georgia was fantastic, but they're a different kind of cat. USC is a good team. I'm not, you know, um, I'm not saying USC is not a good team. Miller Moss played fantastic for them there. Did throw that interception, had a fumble, but the Badgers defense played well to start this game. I mean, out the, the run game for USC, was, this is a solid team, right? The defense was in, eh, right? The defense wasn't great for them, but they had a solid team put together. So when I looked at the schedule, when I looked at this team, I was like, you know, eight wins, nine wins. I could see it, eight wins or nine wins. Now they're on a pace for like four. They're on a pace for four. Because I look at this team and I look at their schedule and I look at where I believe this team is, and they're barely beating, you know, South Dakota or Western Michigan, barely snuck out of those games, right? And then you get blown out by Alabama, and you get blown out by USC. So Alabama's the top. USC is a little bit below them there. And Western Michigan and South Dakota are down at the bottom. But where do you put the Badgers then? Where, where does this Badger team fit into that spectrum? I was hoping the middle. I was hoping the middle or a little above the middle, but right now I'm looking at this team and I'm like, you could see them being just above some of these Western Michigan and South Dakota teams. You could. I don't know. This schedule right now, ahead for Wisconsin, you have a game with Purdue, who Purdue just came off a pretty, uh, it was a tough loss to Nebraska there, 28-10, to 10, played well, but you got to be careful with Purdue now. You got to be careful. Every game now for the Badgers looks like it could be a dicey one. Like, I'm looking at the schedule Purdue, Rutgers, Northwestern, Penn State, Iowa, Oregon, Nebraska, Minnesota. You tell me in that stretch of games, who's the easy win? Who's that game that you look at and you're like, yeah, the Badgers could win that game, right? Beginning of the year, I looked at the schedule and I said, two wins in a row. Probably a loss against Alabama, maybe a close game against USC. And then I rattled off wins until I got to Penn State, I beat Iowa, beat Nebraska, beat Minnesota. I was like, I Badgers can win these games. Now it's like, I don't think they can. I, I don't know truthfully if they can. <clears throat> this program is heading in a, a bad direction. And the coaching's awful. The talents, I, 
I don't even know. I don't even know if the talent is good, bad, or where it's at because I don't think with this coaching regime, I can even tell if the talent's good or not. You got to get good coaching in there first before I can find out if the talent's good enough. I don't know if Luke Fickle's got to take the take the reins of play calling or what, but something needs to change in Madison. I We'll get more into this game. We'll get more into this game in the midweek report and talking about the upcoming game against Purdue. I don't even like this game all the way around. It just, it irritates to talk about. It irritates to talk about. I, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss with this Badger team right now. And there ain't no fixing it coming on. There ain't no fixing it coming in pretty soon. I thought two weeks off getting ready for USC, the game plan would be there. You wouldn't get out coached again. You would be right in this one. You were right in it, but it doesn't feel like it. It doesn't feel like it, and it feels like we got out-coached again. And then we get week after week that Luke Fickle tells us they out-schemed us, they out, you know, out-played us, uh, everything in between. And it's like, when is that going to be an excuse? When, it, when are we going to call that an excuse and say that it doesn't count, right? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. I am this Badger team right now, man, oh, man. I, that's enough about the Badgers. That's enough about the Badgers there. Let's get into a little bit outside of the Badgers, what we saw this last weekend there. So we saw Miami pull off a surprising, it, it was a surprising walk-off win against Virginia Tech because the the call in the end zone, right? The call in the end zone, they called it a Virginia Tech touchdown at first. And then I didn't even see, from what I saw, I didn't even see evidence to say that, uh, it was, should have been overturned. They overturned it. Ends up, we see Miami walk off the win there, 38-34. to 34. So we saw that final there. Texas, slow start against Mississippi State. They end up rolling late, 35-13. to 13. Alabama, Georgia lived up to the hype. Didn't start out living up to the hype. But guess what? Georgia came roaring back in that second half. If you didn't get to watch that game, that was – they called it the game of the year. It turned into an instant classic. I will say that. It turned into an instant classic there. That I I watched the whole thing. I loved it. I loved every second. That was a great game there. Uh, Ohio State, Michigan State, a lot of people thought maybe Michigan State was on the uprise again. Well, Ohio State put a kaposh to that. 38-7 to in that one there. Michigan State didn't look bad. Ohio State just looks good. So Will Howard looks good right now, and Ohio State rolled in that one. Ole Miss gets upset by Kentucky. I'm telling you right now, Kentucky, they went from almost beating Georgia to now they beat Ole Miss. You don't want to mess with Kentucky at this point here. You just don't even want to see them on the schedule there. Oregon beats UCLA. I did not stay up for that game because I know it's Big Ten football. But it started at 10 o'clock at night. It started at 10 o'clock. I'm a I'm bet. I'm a bet by that. So 34 to 13 was the final in that one there. Penn State beats Illinois 21 to 7. Illinois did not come out of that game looking terrible. Defense looks good. I think their defense looks good so far. And Penn State played a solid game all the way around. They win 21-7. Arizona with the upset win over Utah, 23-10. We see Michigan outlast Minnesota, 27-24 there. USC beat Wisconsin, 38-21. LSU with the win over South Alabama, 42-10. Notre Dame. Beats up on Louisville there, 31-24 to there. Louisville got up to the 15th ranked team in the country before that with Notre Dame sitting at 16. And then we see Clemson roll Stanford 40-14 to there. Iowa State got the win over Houston, 20 to nothing. Um, Not really any other notable games to really talk about there. Oklahoma survived against Auburn, 27-21. to Not really anything else notable happening there. Rankings, it got a little weird. I, I would say, you know, I was surprised. Alabama jumped Texas in the rankings there. Alabama got the big win over Georgia, but Texas, I know they haven't played anybody great yet, but they've blown out everybody they've played, right? Slow start against Mississippi State, still end up blowing them out. So I don't know. You know, it doesn't matter. It's eight people who really cares at the end of the day. But Alabama does jump up to one, Texas to two. Ohio State's in the three spot right now, followed by Tennessee then Georgia. Then we see Oregon and Penn State both in the top 10. Michigan at number 10 right now. Michigan is a fraud at number 10. I mean, their defense is fantastic, but that offense with Orgy running the helm, I mean, they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle right now. They're going to struggle definitely with Orgy as the starting quarterback there. So, I mean, they should be ranked number 10. They did have a good win. 
over USC. But outside of that, I think Michigan's going to drop at some point. Dude. They're going to lose a game to somebody. They almost lost to Minnesota there. So USC, they jump up to 11. Ole Miss drops to 12. Uh, outside of that, any other Big Ten teams in the top 25? No Big Ten teams on the outside of that in the top 25. Nebraska did receive votes. They received 30 votes. Oh, wait, forgot. Indiana, 23. And Illinois at 24. Didn't even see them down there. Indiana's been playing good football this year. They're 5-0, and and Illinois sitting there at 4-1. and Big Ten's got some good football teams at the top of that ranking right now there, but sadly, Wisconsin is not one of them. Outside of that, uh, not Big Ten teams getting votes, Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Rutgers. Rutgers is on there. Rutgers with seven votes to get into the top 25. So some interesting stuff happening in the college football world over the weekend there. But we got to flip script here. We got to get into the Packers. We got to get to the Packers game versus the Vikings. And, well, the way that this baby started, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. It wasn't pretty. I, this was a rough one. This was a rough one. So first drive, third and long, Packers had to find a way to get off the field. Right? I have a clear as day in my notes right there. There was a third and long early in this one. Vikings found a way to convert it. Packers couldn't get off the field, ended up with a uh, score there to start out the game. And then the Packers missed a field goal. Now, one missed field goal wasn't going to hurt me so bad. But when there was a second, that's when it hurt. Because you look at the final score, 31-29. to Now, I'm not saying that, yes, if you made that field goal, it would have made 32-31. Yes, it would have. But when the Packers were slowly building that comeback, right, they were slowly building that comeback. I tell you what, 13? When it was 20, it would have been 28 to 13 or whatever it would have been at that point there. 28 to 13 looks a lot better and a lot easier to come back from than 28 to 7 at that point. So those two missed field goals were huge in the game for the Packers. They were huge. And I know Matt LaFleur is going to tell you, you know, he said in his uh, post game there that. He's not worried about Narvison. Right? He's not worried. He's not worried, so we shouldn't be worried, right? He's still got confidence. I said it before. The missed field goals weren't costing us games, but at some point, they're going to cost us a game. It's, this game was not solely on Narvison, right? I'm not, don't get me wrong. I'm not, I'm not blaming this game on Narvison as a whole because there was a lot of things in this game that went wrong for Green Bay that weren't Narvison, right? But those two missed field goals were big time. Those were big time. You got to be able to bang those through, man. They were makeable field goals, right? They were makeable field goals. Now, I'm not saying this as a guy who can make that field goal because I can't. I know I can't. But it's a guy who gets paid to do it, right? So, end of the day, those two field goals were big. I don't know. I mean, I know a lot of Packer fans out there are sitting there and they're like, yeah, you know, we should go out. We should find a kicker. We should find a kicker. I, I wouldn't be opposed to making a competition. Right, I wouldn't be opposed to making a competition because at this point you got to find stability in the kicking room. You got to find some kind of stability in that kicking room. So I don't know if you're just immediately kicking them out the door, but you got to find some stability. And if this continues, you don't want to get too late in the season. And now you're trying to make a change there. So you got to watch it there. Pre-snap penalties killed that first drive, though. I mean, there was a, a pre-snap penalty. Uh, I believe it was a false start. I believe it was a false start on that first drive there. And then, I mean. Wicks did miss a catch on that drive. It was a little low, missed the catch. Wicks has had his issues, you know, hanging on to football. So it's not a problem. I'm not really overly concerned with it, but Wicks did drop a pass there. There was the pre-snap penalty, killed the first drive, ended up in that field goal, ended up as a missed field goal there. So not great. Then we see Matt LaFleur trying to call a timeout, right? First off, he's probably a little upset because the line judge didn't, call for a review, I believe inside of two minutes, if I'm not mistaken, which I don't think I am, inside of two minutes, you're supposed to be able to, it's a booth review, right? Any kind of play like that. So there was a catch by Dobbs in the end zone. I don't think it would have ended up as a touchdown anyways. There was no review or nothing. And then LaFleur's trying to call a timeout and he's running down the field. He's screaming, he's hollering. And they said that his actions were just demonstrative is the word that he used. That's what the official said, is that he was demonstrative when he was... He felt like he was being ignored, essentially, is what LaFleur had to say. And, I mean, he he held himself accountable, right? He's got to be better. The coach has got to be better. But the referees, and, and referees in total this season in the NFL, all the way around, I have not been impressed by, right? But LaFleur gets a little extra, trying to call a timeout down the field there. He's running out on the field. 
they flag him there for an unsportsmanlike conduct. Thank goodness, thank goodness that the Packers still ended up scoring on that drive there. And then, I mean, you had the muff punt there. That changed that trajectory of that drive there. So great stuff there from this Green Bay. The muff punt, I honestly, before that game, I didn't really understand the muff punt rule before that game. That You couldn't advance it. You know, the other team had to gain possession of it before you can advance it there. You just muff punt, you just grab it, right? I did not know that. I was going to, I'm completely honest with you. Like, I've watched football for a very long time. I did not know that rule until I was watching the game yesterday. And then I went and looked, up, looked it up and I was like, oh, you know, that's, that's odd. I, I don't understand it, right? But odd. So interesting thing came out of there with that muff punt. Early on, I thought the Packers struggled containing Sam Darnold. He had a couple plays where he extended them, got out of the pocket, got out of there, and was able to extend play. So I thought that was an issue. McKinney had his fourth pick in four games, which is dang impressive, right? It's dang impressive that McKinney had that fourth pick in four games, but I don't even think it was an interception. I'll be honest with you. He was juggling that baby all the way to the ground. They called the pick. I'm, I'm okay with it, right? I'm okay with it at the end of the day. But at the same time, it's like it wasn't even a pick. I'm watching this. I'm like, you guys would review everything else except for that? Like, I don't know about that one. And then uh, Quay Walker, I – Honestly, I didn't think Quay Walker played a bad game. You know, everybody has really been critical. I've been critical of what I've seen out of Quay Walker. I thought he played a good game. He had one sack today. And in that sack, what I've been trying to see out of Quay Walker was his ability to get off of a block. And in this one, I saw that. And I I was like, okay, okay. We saw what we wanted to see out of Quay Walker is the ability to get off a block and make a hit on the quarterback. He did that. I I was impressed. I was impressed by the, you know, I shouldn't be impressed by that. I should just be expecting that. But I, that's something you, I wanted to see that I like to see. So, Quay Walker, I thought he played well. He had eight tackles on the game. He had a sack. He had a tackle for a loss. He had a quarterback hit. Quay Walker definitely played a good game. I thought he played a good game in this one. Not terrible. Not terrible in this one. Um, The holding call on Kraft. You want to talk about drive killers. You want to talk about play killers, right? Uh, I believe that was Wilson who broke that one to the outside and had a big gain. And then Kraft gets called for the holding there. And that's huge. That's huge. I mean, penalties for the Packers continue week after week to be an issue. This week it was, uh, let's just see here, eight penalties, I believe. They had eight penalties for 68 yards. Continue to be a problem. They continue to be a problem. Packers got to clean that up. They got to clean that up. The simple ones, right? The holding. You got the holding. You got the false starts. You got all that. I mean, you got to be able to clean that up here. You got to be able to clean that up. It's, it's easier said than done, right? Easier said than done. I can say that it's easy and it's not, but it's something that's got to be cleaned up by this Packers team. Uh, the first and long throw that the Packers had, it was first and long, and Love took a shot at the end zone to Melton, and it was covered up. It was covered up pretty well. That throw kind of irritated me. That throw kind of irritated me. There was a couple throws by Love where I looked at it. And I was like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, that the one to Wicks going up the sideline there. Wicks was open five minutes earlier, right? He was open five minutes earlier. And uh, Love threw it late. Defender was there. Wicks, he did. I mean, it hit him in the chest plate, right? It hit him in the chest plate. He had it. But it's a throw that has to be made a couple seconds earlier, right? He had Wicks wide open down the sideline. He got to make that throw. And then he had another throw to Wicks, right? Where Harrison Smith was coming off of the edge there and loft that baby up, just loft it up there. And you, you want to almost try and understand the reasoning behind it, but then you're sitting there and you're watching it and you're like, you were going to get sacked, right? Because there's nobody blocking Harrison Smith coming off the edge. But is that something that, you know, I, I heard people say, well, Wicks has got to understand that situation, right? He's got to understand that Harrison Smith's coming in on block. Love's got to understand that situation. Okay, so then who are we going to blame in that situation, right? I would have rather seen Love take a sack. I would have rather seen him take a sack than just try to throw it down the field, right? Or chuck it out of bounds. Chuck, at least chuck it out of bounds, right? Don't try to loft it up straight down the field where you got safeties and everything hanging out, and they're just like, oh, yeah, here comes the ball. Wicks has no idea the ball's even coming yet. So there was definitely a little bit of rust in this game for Jordan Love. There was definitely a little bit of rust. I thought watching him early on in this game, the thing that concerned me was his inability to push 
and get onto his front leg, which is concerning, right? You're not going to be able to get a lot of zip on that ball, right? There's a couple throws early on where it was more of a loft out there. <clears throat> it worries you. It worries you with him. They took a couple hits, and I was like, he's getting up limping, and I was like, oh, my, why? Why, why is he out there? Why is he out there right now? You know, at halftime, I was honestly sitting there, and I was like, could you throw Willis out there at this point and just, I mean, call it a day with love? You know, it's 28-7. to 7. You don't want to get love hurt even worse. It Was it a thought? I, I don't know if it was an exact thought. I don't know if it's a good thought, but it was definitely a thought that crossed my head in that kind of game because you listen to the halftime report, and they're even like, well, why are they playing Jordan Love in this game against a defensive front for the Vikings that get after you? And they're causing, you know, Jordan Love to try to make quick decisions, you know, try to try to be mobile, and he wasn't really mobile. He wasn't able to get away from the pass rush. So there was a lot of questions with that. There's a lot of questions with that. I'm not saying that I, if I was Matt LaFleur that I wouldn't have played Jordan Love because he's your start, he's your quarterback, right? He's your QB1. When he was ready to go, he was ready to go. But we talked about it, right? You almost, if you were the Vikings, you almost wanted to see Malik. You, you wanted to see Jordan Love at 80% over Malik Willis at 100% because when you're bringing the heat and Jordan – Jordan Love can't run when he's not as mobile as what he you know what he could be if he was healthy. It's hard for him to get away, right? You want it, you want to have a quarterback like that in there, right? With Malik Willis, he's elusive. He's going to get out of the pocket. His first instinct is when the pack, pocket starts to collapse, he's bailing out of there, right? So it was it was one of those decisions where you wanted to see Jordan Love, but if they wouldn't have played Jordan Love because he wasn't completely ready to go, I would have understood it. I would have understood it. Now, is that MCL ever going to completely heal? You know, listening to, or is it going to get better, you know, easier to move, everything like that? Listening to him in the post game, he talked about it a little bit there, and he said that, yeah, it did hinder him a little bit there. He felt it on a couple hits and everything like that. But, you know, he, they asked him if he was going to get, if he thought he was going to get better throughout the season. He said, you know, you hope it does, right? But at the end of the day, you don't know if it's going to. You just kind of got to play through it. Does that make you nervous? I I don't know. I does it make me nervous a little bit? Yeah, I don't want him to take a big hit now. I really don't want him to take a big hit. It makes me nervous every time he gets hit at this point, right? And then we see Christian Watson. Now, this was one of the throws that Jordan Love made that absolutely irritated the ever living snot out of me. It did because that throw to Watson, there was four guys in coverage. There was four guys, if three or four at least, right? I, I thought it was four, maybe it was three. I could be just thinking things right now, but it seemed like he was covered, right? And he throws that ball in there. Now, I'm not blaming Watson's injury completely on Jordan Love, but you know the risk when you go into that area as a running back or as a, a wide receiver, but at the same time, when you throw that ball in there, I believe there was, I can't remember if it was Luke Musgrave or somebody else was standing just off to the left of him. And he was open. If it was Kraft or if it was Musgrave. But you try to force that ball into Christian Watson, and you are forcing him into a situation where if he doesn't get his clock clean there, he's getting it cleaned across the other way, right? So that's a tough spot. That is a tough spot, a dangerous throw. And you're putting your wide receiver, his head is on a platter, and you're just asking for it to get knocked off, right? I don't know. That was a dangerous throw. That was a dangerous throw. And then I believe, you know, everybody was talking about that other interception that he had. When he threw it to, um, it looked like it was going to Kraft, and then it went over his head, and it ended up hitting Dobbs, and then got picked off. He was throwing it to Dobbs. Now, I don't understand that the route there was Kraft was standing right over the top of Dobbs, so Dobbs' vision was a little bit hindered on that throw, and then I'm not trying to make an excuse for Dobbs not catching the football, but his vision's hindered. So now he's like quick trying to react to the ball coming through. That was another tough spot, tough throw. Just a, it was a lot of rust, a lot of yeah, disheartening. It was disheartening watching that game, Packers and Vikings. Really going into it, I didn't know what to expect. This is a good Vikings team. Like, don't get me wrong. I, I will say that. I am not a huge Vikings fan, not at all, not even in the slightest, right? But I will say this is a good Vikings team. This is a good Vikings team. That defense, Brian Flores, I mean, he has done wonders. This is a good Vikings team. The offense is going good. but going good right now. Sam Darnold played well once again for him there. Justin Jefferson, Aaron Jones, they got weapons across the board. They don't even have their complete cast of characters yet because Hawkinson's still out. Addison's playing again. He played well. The Packers, you didn't have Jair. 
you didn't have Valentine. You were trying to mix and match. You had Valentine in there at times. You had Nixon trying to play in coverage there. You're trying to go one-on-one with Jefferson. That usually doesn't end well, even with Jair. But if Jair's there, does it change the, you know, the, the outlook from the defense? You try to go one-on-one with Jair and Jefferson. Does it end well? We don't know. We'll never know from this matchup what would have happened there. But yeah, I think it definitely does change what the Packers were able to do defensively, right? Because you were in a zone a lot of time or lots of the time in that game. And there was just a lot of moments, a lot of moments in this one that, I mean, the drive at the end of the third there on fourth and eight, that's when I talked about there with the, the missed, missed wicks wide open and then ended up trying to force it. Ah, uh, man, man. And then you had Kraft. I mean, he had the big touchdown there down the sideline. But then you have Kraft trying to make extra happen on a play, and he ends up fumbling the football. I don't blame Kraft for that fumble. I, I You know, I, he fumbled the football. Yeah, you, you can't not say that he didn't fumble it, right? But Kraft's trying to make extra yards. He's trying to make something happen. Didn't hang on to the football. I respect the fact that he was trying to get extra yards, but at the same time, it's like, dude, hang on to the football. You know, you're sitting there like, crap. There was just so many points in this game where the Packers, I mean, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't pretty. This was not, this is like what I expected to see week one, right? This is like week one kind of football from both teams. I didn't think the Vikings played a great game. You know, right away, I thought they did. But then after that, I mean, I don't know if it's the truth or not, but it seemed like they kind of went into a prevent defense. They weren't playing up on guys anymore. They were kind of letting the Packers get what they wanted to up front there. The secondary looked like it, at least, because everybody was wide open at one point there. But the Vikings didn't look crisp at times. The Packers looked like it. I mean, it was just all around one of those games. Disheartening game. Vikings moving forward all. Packers the 2-2. Two and two. Now you're sitting there, you're technically, you're, you know, you're two games back of them there, but you're also three games back because the Vikings now own the tiebreaker over you as of now. So there's a lot of, a lot of different implications that came out of this one. I mean, you look at team stats, you look at the Packers in this one, they actually had more total yards, but then you look at the turnovers, four turnovers in this one. And you look at Jordan Love's stat line in this one. It looks great. It looks great down the line there. 32 for 54, four touchdowns, 389 yards. But then you look at the three picks, right? You see those three interceptions. It's just, it was one of those days, man. It was one of those days that you want to wash, rinse, forget, and move on from. Because as a Packer fan, it was disheartening to see the Minnesota Vikings come into Lambeau Field and just, for the first half, have their way with you. And in the second half, you made a comeback, but mistakes after mistakes when you were even making that comeback that led to the loss for the Green Bay Packers. They didn't deserve to win this game, I can tell you that much. I was hoping they would squeak it out, but they definitely did not deserve to win this one at the end of the day there. So with that, that's about all I got for today. I mean, Packers lose to the Vikings, Badgers lose to USC, Brewers, they're going to be in action come Tuesday here for the Wild Card Series. So I cannot wait hopefully some good. I, I, I got to see some good this week, right? You got to see some good. We watched the Packers lose. We watched the uh, the Badgers lose. And their optimism for the Badgers is in the air right now. And the optimism for the Packers, well, I'm still good. I'm still good. But I'm looking at this Brewers team and I'm like, give me something. Just give me something. So we're going to see first pitch of the wild card game. That's starting up on Tuesday, 432. I might be still working during that. So I'm going to tell you what right now, we're probably not going to get the live started up before the Brewers game starts, but we might get on midway through towards the end of it. We might be able to do a post-game report, whatever it is there. We're we're definitely going to get to it on Tuesday there. So with that, like I always say, like, subscribe, follow wherever you're listening on. Make sure next time you're in the, next time you're watching, make sure you're commenting on the show. would love to hear what you guys have to say about the show and everything like that. And if you miss the show, you can find us on all podcast platforms out there, Apple, everything like that. You can find us on that there. So with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go With Trage. Thank you guys for listening. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your night and your Monday. But until I talk to you guys again on Tuesday, deuces.